Welcome to this presentation for the statewide beach bacteria TMDL. My name is Jim Hallmark and I'm an environmental engineer with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. Along with Jason Palmer, a biologist with the department, we will be presenting the findings of our water quality improvement plan for three lakes. This presentation has been prepared and is being presented as part of the public review process for the statewide beach bacteria TMDL. We are, in, we are currently in a public notice period that will go through August 21st of 2023. If you have an official public comment that you would like to make regarding, regarding this presentation or the water quality improvement plan, please send them to either myself or Jason Palmer at the respective emails listed on this slide. Comments must be received by the end of the public review, pi review period, which as mentioned, will end on August 21st of 2023. <clears throat> also, if you would like a copy of the Water Quality Improvement Plan, a link to that document will be provided below this screen. This Water Quality Improvement Plan uh, is the second addendum or part three to the statewide beach bacteria TMDL. Part one, which was our original document included three lakes, Clear Lake, Hickory Grove Lake and Nine Eagles Lake, which are circled in green. This document was submitted and approved by the EPA in 2020. The, origi the original document and video presentation includes more detailed uh, background information and a link to the original document and associated video presentation will be provided below. The first addendum, or part two, of the statewide beach bacteria TMDL included three lakes also, Brushy Creek Lake, Lake McBride, and Lake Aquabi, which are circled in orange. Part two was submitted and approved by EPA in 2022 and a link to the part two document and video presentation will also be provided below. The second addendum or part three of the statewide beach bacteria TMDL is what we're going to be talking about today. This addendum includes Prairie Rose Lake, Lake Kioma and North Twin Lake, specifically Trayman Park Beach. These lakes are circled in blue. You will notice that Twin uh, North Twin Lake has a blue dashed line around it. Um, that is uh, because we had collected all of the uh, uh, field data and we had started our analysis. And before we could complete uh, the report, uh, North Twin Lake was removed from the impaired waters list. However, since we'd already started it, we went ahead and completed the analysis and included it in, in the water quality improvement plan. Future addendums or parts will be prepared and submitted, selecting from the other lakes shown in this figure. However, as stated earlier, we will be discussing the lakes in blue today. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items related to terminology. The word impairment is uh, one that we use frequently in, in the presentation as well as in the document. And a definition for impairment is that uh, is a weakened state or condition or uh, is diminished function. And when we're talking about uh, a water body being impaired, there's something preventing it from meeting its designated function. Uh, as outlined in the water quality standards. In the case of these three lakes, uh, the lakes are impaired for E. coli, which prevented it, preventing it from meeting its designated function of primary recreational use. The other two terms, uh, total maximum daily load or TMDL and water quality improvement plan are uh, different terms and have different meanings. However, sometimes they are used interchangeably. Uh, TMDL refers to the allowable pollutant load that a water body can receive. So it's an actual uh, a number in this case. And the Water Quality Improvement Plan is a document report that contains the TMDL and associated analysis.
So what is the water quality improvement plan? Well, a water quality improvement plan um, is a document. And that document contains the total maximum daily load or TMDL <clears throat> and includes other information such as an implementation plan. Um, so the water quality improvement what is a, plan a TMDL? is a document, but the TMDL is an actual Here it referred to number as the total maximum daily load, but TMDL is mostly what we, we say. And it is, uh, here's the definition of it. It identifies the maximum amount of a pollutant that a body of water can assimilate while still meeting water quality standards or that it's not being impaired. How much of a pollutant can the water body assimilate and not be impaired? Another way of saying it might be how much of a pollutant can it assimilate before its function is diminished or it no longer functions as expected. And again, the TMDL is, is a number, it's a target uh, value that we want to achieve to maintain water quality standards in, in these um, water bodies. And here's an illustration that might kind of help uh, how, how to describe a TMDL. Uh, here's a picture of a mule harnessed to a cart, and, and that's our system. Under, under normal circumstances, the cart would be loaded with boxes or other products, and the mule would pull uh, the cart around the village or whatever, wherever its uh, destination would be. And it, you know, it functions as expected. However, as shown in this picture, there comes a, a time or a point in which the load placed on the cart results in an imbalance in the system, causing the mule to be lifted up off the ground as shown here. In this instance, the system is impaired. It no longer functions as expected and certainly is a case of diminished function. Not, as, not all is lost. The load on the cart can be offloaded and redistributed, resulting in the mule's feet resting back on the ground again and the system performing as expected or meeting its expected function. We can compare this mule cart system to our lake or aquatic system. The mule and the cart represent our lake system and the loader boxes on the cart represent the pollutant load. Just as with the mule cart system, our aquatic system can handle a certain amount of load or boxes and, and still function as expected. However, there comes a point when the pollutant load reaches a tipping point, resulting in the aquatic system not functioning as expected. There is too much pollution or load on the system, resulting in diminished function. Again, all is not lost. The pollutant load to the aquatic system can be reduced, allowing it to function as expected. So now I'm gonna turn some time over to Jason Palmer, a biologist with the department for his portion of the presentation. He will discuss the monitoring efforts related to this water quality improvement plan. After Jason, I will conclude the pre presentation by discussing the, the development of the TMDL within the water quality improvement plan. This is Jason Palmer. I'm with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. Um, and right now, this segment that I'm going to go over uh, pertains to some of the monitoring um, efforts that we have um, conducted in association with the development of um, this particular um, batch of, of beach bacteria, TMDLs, as well as a little bit of background um, about uh, prior sampling or efforts that we've done um, on this front. So at the onset of um, data collection for this larger project, uh, we started with uh, these basic questions, um, so, like where do the impairments originate from? Uh, how do these impairments relate um, in the environment to the broader lake condition? What or where some of the sources might be coming from? Uh, and then last but not least, um, getting into a little bit of how we might think about managing um, these issues that we identify. And so for our study or, or monitoring design, what we looked at is trying to determine whether or not we could identify any gradients in condition 
uh, with bacteria concentrations in both the terrestrial zone uh, in the sand, as well as in the water uh, moving out from the swimming zone and into the open lake. Um, and did we see anything in the way of uh, associations uh, between these two zones, between the, the sand the terrestrial environment and the swimming zone? Also, did we see any similarities or differences um, in what was occurring in the swimming zone area of the water versus you know, moving out you know, into the open lake? And um, how we went about sampling for that uh, was that on the, the sand portion of, the, of this um, sampling design, uh, using uh, the transect-based system that I kind of showed on the previous slide, uh, we set up a grid of sampling across the, the beach and we collected uh, sand cores uh, from the shoreline moving up um, further and further onto the beach. Uh, we collected about a four inch um, core uh, that we analyzed for bacteria concentration uh, to see what um, the levels of bacteria were um, in the sand itself, uh, moving um, from the lake on up into the, uh, into the beach itself. Um, we also set up sampling um, in the aquatic um, zones of the lake along the transects, moving from the shoreline uh, in the swimming zone at ankle, knee, waist, and chest deep, as well as at where the swimming rope would be, and then moving um, on out into the open lake uh, to look for bacteria concentrations in a gradient from the shoreline out into the open lake. We also established an alternate transect where we use the same sampling methodology or spacing uh, that we used in the beach zone to see if on a shoreline that didn't contain a beach, you know, that maybe was more representative of what the landscape was like around these individual lakes to see what the um, gradient looked like or to see if the trends were similar or different on these um, different areas of the lake. We also established uh, monitoring locations uh, at places where we have inlets or water coming into the lake from the watershed, um, as well as at our ambient monitoring location, often the deepest um, location uh, in a lake system to see what sorts of bacteria concentrations we had in these zones. And at each sampling trip we conducted, we would sample from each of these unique areas so that we could develop um, similarities or dissimilarities of these zones. Um, moving straight into the data that was collected for these three lake systems, in looking at the North Twin Lake uh, system in North Central Iowa, we saw that we had uh, a swimming zone um, average over the course of all of our sampling, of about 212 um, MPN. Uh, moving out into the zone, you know, adjacent to the swimming area, uh, we found we had you know, significant drop off down to just 35. And then uh, importantly here at the alternate transect where we use the same uh, gradient of collection, uh, we average only um, 20 MPN. With our detection limit being 10 uh, MPN, this means we were, you know, really not that far above uh, minimum detection limits on average with our data that we collected along a shoreline that didn't contain uh, the swimming beach. And our open lake averages throughout the whole season uh, depicted here at 122. Uh, moving on to Lake Kioma, Southeast Iowa, kind of the same um, types of trends showing up here uh, with the bacteria concentrations in the, in the swimming zone uh, being elevated relative to what we were finding uh, both in the open lake areas where we have watershed delivery potential or at the ambient monitoring location, uh, as well as our alternate um, transect uh, collection point. Um, last, last system um, included in this particular data set that we're gonna be talking about today was the uh, Prairie Rose Lake system. And after several years of sampling um, in, this, in this location, we found um, you know, the similar uh, conditions that have been showing up at a lot of the lakes uh, that we've, we've incorporated this monitoring scheme. Uh, we have, you know, kind of highly elevated bacteria concentrations, 375 MPN per 100 mils uh, on average over multiple years of sampling uh, in the swimming zone, quickly dropping off to really just barely above detection limit at both our open lake areas adjacent to the swimming zone, as well as at our alternate transect where we have um, a shoreline that did not contain a beach. 
um, just really barely above detection, along with our open lake average, averaging out looking at water coming in from the watershed, as well as, you know, at our um, ambient monitoring point, um, just, you know, barely above detection limit. So really highlighting uh, the importance of uh, the swimming zone area in terms of the bacteria concentrations um, in these systems. Um, jumping into the data and, and looking at um, how we characterize our conditions on these systems, uh, looking at all three systems, um, and the data that was collected over those multi-year periods, we see that our highest bacteria concentrations that we collected anywhere in the water, um, any place in the lake, uh, was located at the beach, right at that ankle deep location. So really close um, to, the, to the shoreline itself. Um, and then quickly dropping off as we move you know, further out away from the shoreline. Um, when looking at our data sets and, and comparing these two zones, we also saw consistently across all three um, lake systems that we had um, significantly higher concentrations of bacteria in the swimming zone versus uh, what we observed in the open lake. Um, so this area um, of recreational um, activity, you know, inside the swimming rope zone was significantly higher in bacteria than um, outside of that zone. And zooming in to the other data sets that we collected that kind of help um, paint, paint the broader picture, um, you can see here when we overlay the terrestrial zone sampling um, into this um, bubble plot graph, you can see that we saw some similar associations in the sand and in the water with our sand concentration, uh, bacteria concentrations, kind of peaking in that zone closest to the waterline. So our collections here um, were at the, at the shoreline or at the waterline, uh, and then about uh, 15 feet um, up from the shoreline and moving out um, in you know, 10 foot intervals further out. So uh, what we had here is just an accumulation of bacteria right along the shoreline that coincided uh, with bacteria concentrations, you know, high on the shoreline and the water as well. And when we looked at relationships between these two data sets, we saw that um, over time, when we looked at um, the data from the sand, as, as we, throughout the season, as we increased our bacteria concentration in the sand zone, uh, we saw a corresponding increase in the bacteria concentrations that were observed in the water. Um, the one thing that this graph doesn't do a very good job of depicting is, is looking at the relative um, scale or magnitude of bacteria contamination in these two zones. Um, we use a different um, collection and reporting um, concentration when we look at sand. And so we, we report out in the amount of um, uh, E. coli bacteria that's present in a, in a single um, gram of material of sand. So when we make our um, concentration comparisons to what's happening in the water, we look at about a cubic centimeter of sand equaling a milliliter of water. And there can be several grams, depending on the bulk density of the, of the sample, uh, of, of material inside a cubic centimeter of sand. So when we make these adjustments, um, we can actually see that um, the bacteria concentration in the sand zone um, in, these, in these beach systems are significantly higher uh, than the bacteria concentrations observed in the water portion of the recreational environment. In fact, in this particular round of sampling, we found that um, on these three sites, we averaged between 1,900 and 9,400 times higher uh, concentration of bacteria in the sand versus the water. Uh, and on an individual sampling trip, we observed sand concentrations in excess of 33,000 times higher in E. coli bacteria concentration than what we observe in the, in the adjacent um, water. And this sets the stage um, for um, a, a, a situation where we have, you know, a mass accumulation of a pollutant of concern in close proximity to uh, a water you know, recreational environment where we do our uh, monitoring for uh, bacteria concentrations in the swimming zone. And so when you think about the ability of this material to move uh, from high concentration um, into this, you know, relatively lower concentration environment, 
uh, you don't have to use much of an imagination to, to think of, um, you know, ways in which you can move uh, material, you know, 10 or 15 feet, you know, off of a shoreline into this recreational swimming zone. And you can see a corresponding, uh, you know, pretty rapid drop off in concentrations moving away, like we depicted in the bubble graph um, that was shown earlier. The uh, main ways that we think about this material moving uh, from this sand environment um, into the you know water itself, um, obviously one you know major um, contributing factor can be uh, precipitation or runoff. Um, as you can see here, we you know wash material off the surface of this, of this sand. You know from our sampling, we know we have very high concentrations of bacteria in this zone, um, and the water is entraining those particles and material and then depositing it into that um, you know, water body or into that area of recreational activity. Um, another way that you may not think about as being um, so common, but is actually uh, very important, is the um, ability for wave action to actually um, entrain the material uh, in this zone uh, that we've identified as having uh, high, high concentrations of bacteria, as well as any um, deposited fecal matter or foreign materials uh, that are deposited on the shoreline and kind of picking it up and moving it out in, into that swimming zone. Um, this kind of activity has been uh, shown in uh, various uh, forms of literature in other states uh, to be um, also kind of an important factor for um, increasing bacteria concentrations in those swimming zones. Um, another part of, of the of the puzzle um, comes down comes down to uh, the direct deposition of material in these swimming zones. So when thinking about times where it might be safe um, for recreational um, activities, you know, just because it hasn't rained very frequently, um, very recently, and you know, it could be a calm day otherwise, uh, you can also get the direct deposition of fecal matter into the water. Uh, which can, you know, raise the bacteria comfort concentrations um, on, on that local level. Um, so from the data that we developed for this particular batch of, of lakes that we sampled, as well as um, prior uh, efforts on previous lakes, uh, we decided to run through with a TMDL development um, using these data, looking at that sort of capture zone or that, that area of importance um, in close proximity to the swimming uh, beach and the swimming uh, recreational swimming area and thinking about the transport of materials from this small terrestrial zone into this um, recreational body of water right here. And to do this, um, our TMDL modeler is using a load duration curve model and looking at uh, modeling the load capacity of this swimming zone or how much um, fecal or, uh, e. coli bacteria can be um, incorporated into this lake um, portion of the lake and still maintain um, you know safe recreational standards. And then from those data, well, we can look at what our existing load is and estimate our reductions. And my colleague uh, is going to get deeper into the um, uh, breakdown of how we did this for these um, three particular systems. Thanks uh, for your presentation, Jason. Jason, again, as I mentioned, I will finish up this presentation by discussing the development uh, of our TMDL and the Water Quality Improvement Plan and addressing the E. coli impairment for these three beaches. As part of the Water Quality Improvement Plan and what I will discuss here today, include a, a brief description of the three beaches uh, potential pollutant sources at these beaches, the development of, of the uh, TMDL or total maximum daily load, and then follow up um, with some impl implementation plan discussion and list some of the potential solutions to resolve the E. coli issue at our beach areas. Okay, so there are uh, three lakes in this water quality improvement plan, Prairie Rose Lake. Um, we have Prairie Rose Lake, Lake Kioma, and North Twin Lake. And again, specifically, that's uh, Trayman uh, Park Beach on the north end of, of North Twin Lake. And also, again, North Twin Lake was removed 
from the impaired waters list. But since we'd already begun our analysis of it, we went ahead and we went ahead and included it in this uh, in this document. So based on the work that Jason had done, we were able to narrow down the location and source of the E. coli impairments for each of these lakes to the beach shed area. And the beach shed area is a very small and limited area, which is outlined in yellow for each of these beaches. Uh, the beach shed area uh, for these three beaches range in size from three and a half acres to just over six and a half acres. Uh, we also identified the swimming area at, e at each uh, beach, or and then sometimes the swimming area is referred to the near shore uh, beach volume. And this area is highlighted or outlined in, in red for each of these beaches. Um, the volume of these uh, swimming areas, their near shore beach volume range from one and a half acre feet to uh, just over uh, 1, 1.6 acre feet. An acre foot is, uh, is basically, it's, it's a depth of the water over one acre. So for one acre foot, there would be one foot of water over an acre. And, and an acre is about the size of a football field. The swimming area was 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 defined from um, so edge of sand to edge of sand along the shoreline, and it extended out to a depth of four feet, which is about chest depth, and then extended out an additional three feet. With this information, we began to work on a water quality improvement plan focusing on the beach shed area and the swimming area or the near shore beach volume, which is adjacent to the, the, G, the, the beach. Uh, since, since the process used to develop a TMDL for all the beaches is the same, we'll walk through one using Prairie Rose Lake as an example. All right, so Here's uh, the beach at uh, Prairie Rose Lake, and here's the swim area at uh, Prairie Rose Lake. Water quality samples were collected in each swimming area at each beach as part of the state's ambient beach monitoring program. And these white dots can represent uh, collection points, uh, sampling collection points. Um, these, these samples were collected and, anal and analyzed, and, and based on the results of these samples, the lakes in this water quality improvement plan were placed on the impaired waters list for E. coli. Samples collected as part of the beach monitoring program go back as far as 2000 for Prairie Rose Lake and Lake Kioma and 2004 for North Twin Lake. Samples used in the analysis of this TMDL date back to the earliest samples taken in the assessment cycle in which the lakes were placed on the impaired waters list. For Prairie Rose Lake, samples used were, were uh, collected from 2008, 2022. And all samples used in the analysis were collected between March 15th to November 15th, which is the recreational season in Iowa. Uh, once a water body has been identified as impaired, we will need to generate a water qu quality improvement plan. So we begin by analyzing the water quality data that has been collected. In this analysis, uh, we'll go ahead and um, plot our pollutant of concern, which is E. coli, uh, along the y-axis. Um, and we, we plot it uh, based on a concentration, which is the uh, number of organisms per 100 milliliters. Um, we'd note here that 
the y-axis is in a logarithmic scale, which means that each uh, each value on the on the graph is ten times greater than the previous one. So we start out with one, ten, a hundred, a thousand, up to a hundred thousand. So the difference between each of of these values is uh, is a factor of ten. Um, on the along the x-axis is uh, we plot it in in time, and what we're showing here is uh, the months March March fifteenth through November fifteenth. Uh, however, these uh, uh, this is actually in in the time is in days, but we just plotted the months because if we had, had shown each date, it just would have been too cluttered and, and confusing to, to read. So um, while this this time period the, in the x-axis is uh, measured in, in days, we're actually just showing the individual months. Um, by doing it this way, we can break the the samples into three specific seasons. We have our spring, summer, and fall. And this will help us identify the time frame when E. coli concentrations are the most problematic and help in determining what time of year the most emphasis should be placed to address the E. coli. One, one thing here else to note is that um, our spring samples were collected between March 15th and May 23rd. Our summer samples were collected between May 24th and September 7th. And our fall samples were collected uh, from September 8th to November 15th. And we've extended the summer months uh, one week on each end to be able to include the Memorial and Labor Day holidays in, in, the, summer, in the summer sample period. Um, typically, most of your recreational activities, uh, summertime activities are going to occur between that Memorial Day and Labor Day holidays. Next, we'll plot the maximum allowable E. coli or um, our loading capacity or our TMDL. Uh, that is represented by this green dashed line, which represents a concentration of 235 organisms per 100 milliliters. And again, that that is our actual TMDL, the maximum allowable pollutant uh, that the water body uh, can, can uh, handle and still meet water quality standards. Okay, so ne next we are going to go ahead and plot our spring samples. Again, these are all the samples that were collected between March 15th and May 23rd in the years 2008 through 2022. And along with uh, these individual sample plots, we're gonna plot the existing load that we see for the, the spring uh, the springtime. And th this line here represents the 90th percentile of, of these samples. Um, it's this uh, black dotted line. Um, as we see here in this particular instance that uh, the existing loading for the springtime is, is below our allowable concentration of 235. Next, we'll go ahead and plot our summer data, and, and that is those uh, samples that were collected uh, between May 24th and September 7th from the years 2008 to the two th two, from the year 2008 to 2022. Uh, and along with, with that, we'll go ahead and plot the existing loading for our summer samples, which again is the 90th percentile of, of all of these samples collected during this time frame, and, and that is represented by this red dotted line. And as we can see here, this red dotted line is above our green dashed line. And, and the difference between uh, these two, two lines represents the amount of uh, uh, E. coli 
reduction needed to achieve water quality, uh, compliance with water quality standards. And so with this information, um, we, we can tell um, which season um, is gonna be more problematic and where we need to focus our efforts to reduce the levels of E. coli. Um, and, and as a note, here in Prairie Rose State Park, uh, there were no fall samples. So there were no samples available uh, for this particular beach after September 7th. We can take that information <clears throat> and put it into a table. <clears throat> and we can see here, this is our a table of concentrations. This uh, our observed load, which was 1100 organisms per 100 milliliters. Um, here's our allowable load. Here's the difference between the two and results in a um, reduction of about uh, approximately 80% of the existing E. coli concentration. <clears throat> These other numbers here we'll talk about in just a little bit, uh, but it, it is worth noting that our TMDL and the allowable load are the same at, at 235. This table down here is the same information, the only difference being these values are in a total mass of organisms uh, uh, equal uh, per day where this is a concentration. And we obtain these values here in the, uh, the, mass, con uh, the mass values is uh, multiplying the concentrations by the volume of the swim area and, and some uh, conversion factors. So kind of coming back to our question here, what is a TMDL? Um, again, it's, it, it identifies the maximum amount of a pollutant that a body of water can assimilate and still meet the water quality standards. And, and as, um, to, to develop uh, the water quality improvement plan, we look at, there are, we look at four areas of interest. Um, there's our target, that, that is our uh, pollutant of concern. What, what, what are we concerned with? Uh, sources, where, where, what are the sources that contribute to, uh, to this impairment? Um, and, and, and then we're going to look at uh, an equation. There's a TMDL equation. We'll just kind of briefly discuss that. And then last of all is, is an allocation, how those uh, E. coli sources are allocated, you know, through a, a permitting or a land use uh, perspective. So again, our target was E. coli. What, uh, what, it, what is E. coli? Well, we know it's a large and diverse group of, of bacteria. It's found in human and animal waste. It's not necessarily harmful to humans. Uh, it can indicate the presence of harmful pathogens. So why do we use E. coli? Well, I guess the main reason is that there's just too many possible pathogens to, to monitor for, it would be impractical to sample and monitor for every single pathogen. So E. coli has uh, been accepted as, as an indicator of fecal contamination. And, and so that's what we're using at this point in time. What are the potential uh, E. coli sources in this uh, beach shed area? Well, their uh, sources are separated into two categories. There's a point source and a non-point source. Point sources are those sources that require a, a discharge permit, an NPDES permit, or otherwise known as a National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit. And the best example of a of a point source would be a wastewater treatment plant that 
that discharges to a receiving stream. Point sources have conditions in their permits that limit the amount of pollutant that can be discharged in its effluent. Um, and in this particular case with these three beaches, um, our, our beach sheds are extremely small. So there are no point sources in any of these beach sheds that we'll be discussing uh, today or that we need to consider in our analysis. The next uh, potential source is our non-point sources. And probably the best example of a non-point source would be pollutants contained with storm runoff. You know, it rains and whatever happens to be on the surface of the ground, it runs, it's, it's collected and, and uh, moved along with, with the storm runoff to find its way into um, our beaches and, and waterways. And in this particular uh, case, some of the uh, non-point sources would include retention of E. coli in the sand environment, a direct deposition in the streams and lakes, uh, waterfowl loafing on the beach and, and uh, their waste products finding, again, finding their way into the, the um, uh, swimming areas, and then uh, waste generated by pets and other wildlife. All right, just kind of summarize real quick. Uh, what is a TMDL? We've talked about a target. Our target or our pollutant of concern is E. coli. Our sources are point source and non-point source. And we have no point sources within this particular watershed, these watersheds. Um, so here's, here's our TMDL equation. Um, pretty simple. We have our TMDL, which or our loading capacity, our target load, allowable load, as I've maybe mentioned and discussed earlier, is the summation of all of our waste load allocations, plus our load allocations, plus um, some margin of safety. And I guess to break that down and explain it even further, our point sources become uh, the waste load allocations. Uh, those point sources being those sources that are permitted, have an NPDES, NPDES discharge permit. Then um, our load allocations are those non-point sources, those sources that do not require uh, any type of permit. And, and then there is a margin of safety, which we use to account for uncertainties in, in, in this system. All right, and then putting the numbers that uh, we, we've already generated, again, here's our TMDL equation. Um, our TMDL, total maximum daily load or loading capacity is already, is equal to 235 organisms per 100 milliliters and uh, in a concentration, here's the mass. Remember the mass is the concentration times the volume of the swimming area. Remember, we're talking about Prairie Rose Lake here. Um, and then we've determined that there are no point sources, so our waste load allocation goes to zero, leaving us with uh, a load allocation and a margin of safety. And our margin of safety is 10% 10, 10 of, our, of our load capacity or our TMDL value, and, the, and whatever's left over is, is um, attributed or given to uh, our load allocation or the non-point source. So again, and I've shown this table uh, before, um, here's, here's what we generate. We could see from our, the graphs that we put together. And these values down here kind of represent the, the TMDL equation where we know that's our loading capacity, our allowable load. Um, there's our margin of safety and, and then the difference between the TMDL and the margin of safety is what's left over is our load allocation 
And again, this table down here is just the conversion of, of these concentration values into a mass of uh, organisms per day. <clears throat> And maybe this, uh, for some people, it might be a little more clear just to see it in a in a graphical uh, format. Um, I've taken out all of our individual data points, and we can see here our our um, existing loading at uh, during the summer months at 1,100. Here's our allowable load loading capacity at 235. The difference between those two is is our uh, required reduction of 865, and and then down here we can see here's here's our uh, load allocation of 211.5 and our margin of safety at 23.5, and the summation of those two would be equal to this value of 235. Next, we discuss an implementation plan. And the implementation plan discusses some possible solutions or strategies to resolve and reduce the E. coli at, at these beaches. From the list of possible strategies, uh, I have highlighted one, the raking and grooming activities, uh, and that is one possible alternative to help reduce E. coli at the beaches. This is a picture of beach raking being executed by Iowa DNR staff at McIntosh Woods State Park. Beach raking or grooming is the practice of removing debris and other material from the beach environment. It typically includes pulling a mechanical rake behind a tractor, as you see here in this picture. The rake is on a rotating mesh belt that extends into the sand, picking up debris and other material. The mesh belt allows the sand to fall uh, back through to the beach and the debris is deposited into a hopper where it can uh, be disposed of. And this is just one method to help clean up the beach or one strategy to help clean up the beach environment and reduce E. coli in the swimming areas. With that, thank you for watching this presentation today. If you have any comments or questions, uh, related to, to this presentation or the Water Quality Improvement Plan, you can send those comments uh, to either myself at james.hallmark at dnr.iowa.gov or to our general TMDL comment email, which is tmdlcomment at dnr.iowa.gov. Or you can send your comments to Jason Palmer at Jason dot palmer at dnr.iowa.gov. We must receive those comments by Monday, August 21st of 2023. Thank you again for watching this presentation.